Good afternoon. The Lord be with you. I'd like to welcome you here for the Scripture and Ministry Lecture as part of the uh, Henry Center for Theological Understanding. And uh, if you're here, you probably know that we have a very special guest with us. Uh, we're very excited to, to welcome Dr. Richard Mao, who is the president of Fuller Seminary, has been the president since 1993, where he also served as provost and senior vice president as well. He is a philosopher, he is a scholar, he is an author. Uh, he's been on faculty at Fuller since 1985. He's also been on faculty at Calvin uh, for 17 years before that. Uh, he's a graduate of Houghton, graduate of the University of Alberta, and he holds a Ph.D. in philosophy from the University of Chicago. Uh, you probably also know that Dr. Mao is a prolific author, is involved both in editing and writing. He's been the editor of the Reform Journal. He's served on many different editorial boards, including currently Books and Culture, and he's the author of 17 books, uh, books such as The God Who Commands, The Smell of Sawdust. He shines in all that's fair, culture and common grace. Calvinism in the Las Vegas airport. Prayer at Burger King. And uh, if you couldn't tell from those titles, Dr. Mao is well known around the world for his leadership in engaging with culture as a Christian and in helping us as Christians to engage with culture. But I think just as much he is known as one who engages with those who differ from him in an ironic way, in a way that reflects the grace of the gospel and uh, intellectual excellence and integrity. Uh, he is a panelist on the online forum on faith, which is part of Newsweek and Washington Post. And in 2007, Princeton Theological Seminary awarded him the Abraham Kuyper Prize for Excellence in Reformed Theology and Public Life. He's the vice president of ATS presently, which uh, all of us here at TEDS are very aware of and appreciative of. Um, he is also active in ecumenical and interfaith activities and uh, presently represents the PCUSA as the co-chair of the official Reformed Catholic Dialogue. He's married to his wife, Phyllis, uh, who is an art historian, and their son, Dirk, daughter-in-law, Christine, and grandsons, Willem and Peter, live in Arkansas. Um, another interesting thing that I uh, just learned is that Dr. Mao's story intersects with Dr. Henry's story. Uh, apparently, uh, Dr. Mao su submitted his first article to CT, to the then editor of CT, uh, Dr. Carl Henry. And uh, if you've looked at the recent, uh, edi uh, recent uh, uh, edition of Christianity Today, uh, you'll see that uh, the title of this article really shows that Dr. Mao should be here today. Uh, if there were no other reason to invite him, it was, the title of that article is, uh, really drives it home for us. The title was, Carl Henry Was Right. <laughs> Dr. Mao, we're very happy to have you here with us. Today, his topic is Confessions of an Evangelical Pietist. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Dr. Mao. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here to uh, see some old friends and to be back on this campus. And I really look forward to uh, not only a formal presentation today, but a lot of uh, informal uh, interaction. I'm going to go for 45 or 50 minutes and then look forward to your, uh, your questions, your reproof, uh, wh whatever. But uh, I begin my confessions of an evangelical pietist. Back in the, the mid-1970s, when I was uh, teaching philosophy at Calvin College, my then colleague, uh, Nicholas Waldersdorf, uh, delivered an address that was sponsored by a local Christian Reformed congregation in Grand Rapids, in which he set forth a typology of different minds within the uh, conservative Dutch Calvinist community. He, uh, he employed three labels, the doctrinalist, the pietist, and the Kuyperian. These labels signified for him three different perspectives on among other things, on the kind of book the Bible is. For the doctrinalist, the Bible primarily sets forth religious teachings, doctrines to which we must give our intellectual assent. For the pietist, on the other hand, 
The Bible tends to be treated as a devotional handbook, the reading of which is meant to generate certain godly experiences and to form important subjective traits. And for the Kyperian, he said, the Bible is meant to give us our cultural marching orders, instructing us in the ways of discipleship in the collective patterns of life in the larger human community. These three views of the Bible, Waltersdorf argued, generate three different basic tests for what it means to be faithful to what the Bible means to convey. For some, the fundamental question has to do with what truth claims we accept about God and God's will for humankind. <clears throat> for others, the test is an experiential one, what's, what's in your heart. For still others, the most important question is whether a person is aligned with God's cultural transforming purposes in the world. Waltersdorf's typology has wider application than simply to Dutch Calvinism, a fact that George Marsden recognized when he adapted it for a broader use by substituting the label culturalist for Waltersdorf's Kuyperian, thus recognizing the reality of the kind of evangelicalism that emphasizes working for cultural renewal without linking that theologically to the influence of 19th century Dutch writers. This important applicability of our broader applicability of the typology is evident in the fact that most of us can easily imagine a, a conversation in which one Christian makes much of the importance of doctrine and another challenges that person by warning of the inadequacy of mere head knowledge for entering the kingdom. After all, the pietists will remind the doctrinalist the devil has a fairly orthodox theology, but he is still a citizen of hell. The doctrinalist will then respond that our feelings, our subjective states, can be misleading unless they are grounded in a solid grasp of the truth. But suddenly a, a third party enters the conversation to point out that a person can have an orthodox theology and a strong personal piety and still be a racist or a perpetrator of economic injustice. At that point, predictably, the doctrinalist and the pietist will respond with a warning against works righteousness, and the argument goes on and on. Wolfsdorf was certainly correct then in identifying some obvious strands that often stand in tension. But I do have a problem with his use of the Kuyperian label. For Waltersdorf, it was shorthand for characterizing what he would advocate in his subsequent writings as world formative Christianity. I do have strong affinities with that kind of culturalist emphasis. Indeed, I've been much influenced by it. But in the final analysis, I'm a pietist. And the truth be told, I think Abraham Kuyper was also a pietist. I don't see Kuyper as a Kuyperian in Waltersdorf's sense of the term. It's not to deny that the great 19th century Dutch theologian and activist, Prime Minister of the Netherlands for a while, that he called for the kind of Christianity that takes cultural transformation seriously. Many folks who know very little about Kuyper's life and thought can at least quote some version of his famous bold declaration that there is, I'm quoting him, there is not one square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. But Kuyper also actively opposed the liberal theological teachings of his day, to the point that he even led a major exodus from the large mainline reformed denomination in the Netherlands. And during his many decades as an important public and ecclesiastical leader, he regularly wrote very profound and very pious meditations on biblical themes. The, the spirit of these meditations being nicely captured by the title of the large volume, containing many of them, almost 700 pages in length, the title, To Be Near Unto God, a very pietist title taken from the final verse of Psalm 73. But as for me, the psalmist says, it is good to be near unto God. My main purpose here, though, is not to give a detailed exposition of Kuiper. Rather, I want to offer some pietist confessions of my own. First of all, 
in the sense that I want to bear witness to the basic pietist emphasis on the priority of inner transformation, an emphasis that I think best comports with an evangelical understanding of how to integrate, as we often say, head, heart, and hands. But I also want to confess some of my own worries about some of the defective tendencies that seem constantly to plague a pietist kind of Christianity, as well as pointing to ways that a healthy pietism can enrich our doctrinal and our cultural explorations. For those of us who identify with the pietist tradition, there's no better example of what we are about than John Wesley's well-known testimony regarding his Aldersgate experience. As the story goes, uh, Wesley attended on May 24, 1738, a meeting at Aldersgate where someone read from Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. Wesley reported that at that point where Luther in his text, and I'm quoting Wesley now, was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation. And an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. End quote. <clears throat> The kind of very direct and datable experience that Wesley was describing has a link in my own spiritual journey to the fundamentalist altar calls of my youth. Typically, there would come a point in an evangelistic service when the preacher would intone, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, please. And then the people present would be asked to search their individual hearts. Those who had not yet come to faith in Christ were urged to accept him right then. But it was also a time of self-examination for the rest of us who were given the opportunity to look into our hearts anew and reflect honestly about our relationship with the Lord. And in those moments we sang hymns as well, as you're all on the altar of sacrifice lead, I surrender all, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Those moments and those hymns were a crucial element in my own spiritual formation. They were occasions for me when I stood in, in ways that I'd never quite experienced elsewhere, where I stood face to face with eternity. Whatever else the sawdust trail meant to me, and not all of it was positive, it was for me in those moments a sacred space of the sort that I haven't been able to find with the same profundity in other regions of the Christian world. Ernest Steffler was a scholar who devoted his life to the study of pietism in its many forms, Lutheran, Reformed, Anabaptist, Moravian, Puritan, Wesleyan, and the like. His magnum opus, The, the Rise of Evangelical Pietism, still stands as the best overall survey of pietism as an international movement. Steffler not only chron chronicled the various manifestations of pietism in great detail, he did so with an obvious love for his subject matter, which meant, among other things, that he drew attention to strengths in pietism that are often ignored by others. Indeed, his study of American pietism, in that study, he insisted that there wasn't only a social conscience at work in many pietist subgroups, that there wasn't just a social, that, that not only was, was there a social conscience at work in many pietist subgroups, but that the movement in general was an influential force for creating the environment for important 20th century gains in the promoting of, of social justice. He was convinced, he said, and I'm quoting, that the pietist understanding of life, which regards every fellow believer as sister or brother, helped to begin the process of breaking down the rigid barriers associated with ethnic origin, race, and sex, which Americans originally inherited from Europe. While he did much to highlight pietism's strengths, Steffler was not insensitive to the movement's faults. He specifically singled out uh, three...